If you're a first-time visitor here to Water Springs, we want to welcome you. Pray that it'll be the first of many times coming to worship with us and hang out. Just to let you know what we're doing on a weekly basis, we're going through The Great Adventure, which is a daily Bible reading uh, for these three years, and we'll just travel through the Scriptures from Genesis to Revelation in a three-year period of time. Now, I know that some people are deeply, deeply troubled because the one day out of three years that is not there is leap year, and it's tomorrow, so I'm sure you'll figure out something. But uh, this week's reading was 2 Chronicles chapter 9 through 15, and so our message each weekend comes from that portion of Scripture. So if you have a Bible, I would encourage you to open up to 2 Chronicles chapter 9 as we look at our message, The Quest. A quest is an arduous or difficult journey to discover something. And there is a woman that takes a quest. She goes on a quest to travel some 1,400 miles, 12 to 1,400 miles one way, 24 to 2,800 miles round trip, something that's going to take her between four and uh, four months to six months, depending on how long that she stays there. And what would move somebody in a day and age like that to travel so far just to discover the wisdom of a man by the name of Solomon. And as we look at this passage of Scripture, we're going to learn some valuable lessons for ourselves because you see, not only do we see this ancient story that is a, a picture of our Lord Jesus, but Jesus lifts that story up and says there's a spiritual application for you and I. So let's look at the first two verses of chapter 9 to get us going, and we'll also be looking at a verse in Matthew chapter 12. It says, now when the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon, she came to Jerusalem to test Solomon with hard questions. Having a very great retinue, camels that bore spices, gold in abundance, and precious stones. And when she came to Solomon, she spoke with him about all that was in her heart. So Solomon answered all her questions. There was nothing so difficult for Solomon that he could not explain it to her. Then in Matthew chapter 12, verse 42, Jesus takes this story and he applies it to his generation, and we're going to take this story and apply it to our generation. It says in Matthew 12, verse 42, the queen of the south will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and indeed a greater than Solomon is here. Solomon, in fact, was the wisest man on terra firma, on planet earth, until the coming of the Lord Jesus, who he declares is the greater than Solomon. Solomon's name means peace. He's the king of peace there of Jerusalem and of the Jewish people. And Jesus, our Savior, is also the king of peace and the king of righteousness. And yet this fame that came to this king was God-given, spirit-inspired, downloaded into his heart and life by an almighty, all-knowing, everywhere present at once God. You see, Solomon as a young man, most believe generally that Solomon became king when he was about between 17 and 20 years of age. And in his youth, in a dream, after offering sacrifices, he was in this dream, and God came to him in the dream, and he spoke to Solomon's heart in this dream, and he said to him, Solomon, ask, what do you want? What do you need? Can you imagine the Lord coming with a blank check like that for you in your prayer life? Right now, what would you ask for? Some of you immediately said, the numbers for the Powerball. Some of you said that the Lord would change my husband. Some of you had all kinds of uh, thoughts that went through your mind. But Solomon in his young uh, kingship, he said, Lord, give me understanding and wisdom and discernment to judge your people. And so the Lord, it pleased the Lord, and so he downloaded into him all of this incredible wisdom and knowledge. And he began to display it right away. The story after his prayer, the first story of wisdom, has to do with two prostitutes. They were living together, and both of them were pregnant from their lifestyle of prostitution. And the one had a baby. And as she had this baby, a couple of days later, the other prostitute had a baby. But the second prostitute, in the middle of the night, she accidentally rolled over and smothered her child to death. 
And in the middle of the night, she woke up and she saw that her baby wasn't breathing. She realized what she had done, that her baby was dead. And so this mischievous prostitute took her dead baby and put it in bed with the other prostitute and took her live baby and put it in bed with her. But in the morning when the other prostitute woke up and said, oh no, my baby's cold, it's dead, she looked at it and she said, this is not my baby. Ladies, you know, right? You know which one's your baby. This is not my baby. And she says, hey, you stole my baby in the middle of the night. Well, they got in this big argument, and the lady said, no, that's, you, you must have rolled over in the middle of the night and smothered your baby. And so imagine as the king, one of his first big court cases, if you will, to discern between this, how do you, no DNA, no way to, no eyewitnesses, how are you going to figure this out, right? The one prostitute says, the dead baby is hers, and the other one said, no, this live baby's mine. And so Solomon says, what to do? God gives him this wisdom. He calls for a sword. And the sword comes. And can you picture the sol soldier? I don't know if Solomon grabbed the sword in his own hand and said, this is what we're going to do. We're going to chop this baby in half. You get half, you get half, just like spl splitting a Snickers bar. It's okay. You're going to each go home with a half of a baby. And Solomon knew what it was going to produce. The one woman immediately said, fine. She can't have it. I can't have it. Split it in half. Now that reveals something, doesn't it, about a woman's heart? And the other, mo the, the actual mother said, no, no, no. Don't, don't harm my baby. She, she can have my baby. Solomon's like, well, it's obviously that you're the mother. Here you go. And it says his fame from that story began to take place. Now, for 20 years, according to the chronology of what's going on, for 20 years, this wisdom has been going on. Solomon, in seven years, built the house of the Lord. In 13 years, he built his own house. And he is in the zenith. He is in the height of his fame as a king. And in those days, obviously, with no newspapers, no internet, no email or Twitter or any of those things, no texts, how does fame of somebody travel 12 to 1,400 miles all the way down to the south in the southern peninsula of Saudi Arabia, which we would know today as modern-day Yemen? And how does this get all the way there? Well, through trade. In those days, the trade routes went everywhere. People selling their, their goods and their wares. So there was this intricate, very detailed uh, map, if you will, of the known world of people that are traveling salesmen. And they would bring the reports to all of the world uh, in that area of the world about Solomon and his fame. And it reached down 12 to 1,400 miles away in Yemen to the Queen of Sheba. We don't know how old she is. They, they had monarchs in that area. They had kings, but they also had a queen. And she hears, no doubt she hears it once. She hears it twice. Now she hears it a half a dozen times. She till, hears it 12 dozen times. That there's this incredible king, this incredible temple, this incredible people of God up there in Israel. And she's so intrigued. She's so fascinated. She loads up a big caravan of people, camels and relationships and resources. And they take off for a two to two and a half month journey, traveling 15 to 20 miles a day, all the way there. And it tells us, in verse 1, that she did basically five things. It says she heard of his fame, number one. She came to Jerusalem, and that's a, that's a quest, that's an arduous, long journey. I mean, there's no rest areas, ladies, right? There's no Motel 6. You're traveling two and a half months through desert and wilderness, and she came to Jerusalem. She tested Solomon, it says, with hard questions. She brought this incredible group of people and all these resources. And it says in verse, at the end of verse 1, And when she came to Solomon, she spoke with him about all that was in her heart. She wanted to test him with hard questions. I like the King James here. It says she communed with him with Everything that was in her heart. Literally, the Hebrew means it's just those words that we kind of mutter or bubble up out of our heart. You ever mutter to yourself? You're walking around, you're thinking about stuff, and it's just, you're talking out loud to yourself. Maybe somebody in the other room says, did you say something? No, I'm just in here muttering, and, you know, I, I'm processing this stuff. And, and we don't know how old she is. Let's just, to get a picture in our mind, let's assign her basically between 35 and 45 years of age. And all of the questions, all of the hard things that has piled up and stacked up in her heart, issues about God, about herself, about sin, about heaven, about hell, about morality, about husband and wife relationships and children and about money and resources and leadership as a queen, uh, moral issues, ethical issues, political issues, uh, military issues, all the things that rose up in her heart and nowhere to get answers. Nowhere to get answers. 
And so she's willing to travel 12 to 1,400 miles to get some answers from Solomon. I'd say that's a pretty motivated gal. And a lot of people in t- couldn't even drive 15 minutes to get to church this morning, let alone travel 12 to 1,400 miles, right? No motivation whatsoever. And she is going to go all of that way, and now as she finally gets an audience, Solomon's a busy man, everybody's vying for his time and his energy, and she now has an interview with him, and she unloads her heart. Every hard question, every difficult question, there's nothing that she, maybe she had a list. She, she was going through her little uh, notebook, and she's like question after question after question, and he just answered one after the other. With God-given wisdom, what does the Bible say? What does the God of Israel say? And this is the source, this is the inspiration of his wisdom, is from God. And so this wisdom is of a godly nature. And so, you know, some of us have come to the house of the Lord this morning with questions. And one of the things that happens to us in the Christian life is you begin to take for granted all the answers to all the questions that you already know. This is the beautiful thing about the Christian life. When I think about who is God, that's a natural question that every human being sometimes asks in their mind. And the Bible gives me that revelation. I know who God is because I've, I've read the Bible. He describes himself. It's his own autobiography to explain it. Who am I? I'm created by God. The scriptures declare that God is the creator, that we did not evolve. God begins to answer all of these questions. What's our purpose in life? Well, to love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And so now, all of a sudden, I, oh, okay, my, my goal in life is to love God with all my heart and to love my neighbor as myself. To begin to pursue these things, well, how's marriage work? Well, God created marriage. He, he created the genetics. He made them male and female from the, your very chromosome, your male or your female, and he created this whole thing called marriage. And How's marriage to work? What's the husband's role? What's the wife's role? Then the children, the fruit of that love relationship show on the, on the scene. How do you train your child in love and truth and discipline so that you, you raise a, a child, a son and a daughter, or a whole crew of them that are such a blessing rather than uh, chaos? How do you do these things? When we die, where are we going? What does the Bible say? All of these things, the Bible answers all this. It's all these hard questions that humans have to, uh, in their hearts and their minds, but this is the key. Can I tune you into this key? She asked Solomon all these questions. There was nothing too hard for him to explain so that she could understand it. But what does that tell us? She had to accept the answers that are given to her. Now, this is the thing that I find. Lots of people have hard questions, and they come to me as a preacher, somebody that knows God, somebody that they come to you at work because you're a Christian, you know the Bible, and they come to us and they ask me all these questions, and I say, well, the Bible says this, and the Bible says that, and the Bible says this, and the Bible says that, and the Bible, and what I find is people that are actually hungry for the right answers, they love it, and their their hearts are satisfied, but the people that go through and they disagree every time I give God's answer, (laughs) You mean to tell me that the only way to get to heaven is through Jesus Christ? Yeah, that's what the Bible says. John 14, 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father but by me. Well, I just don't buy that. I don't agree with that at all. I, said, I didn't ask if you, I mean, it, it's not a, you know, all of heaven is not holding its breath to see if you're going to agree. Do you know that? I mean, the angels are not like, oh my, you disagree. No. The biggest part of asking questions of the greater than Solomon, the Lord Jesus Christ, even who you wanted to hear an answer from today, is God has answers for you. Do you like those answers? That's the, that's the issue. Because when your heart is hard, you don't like the answers. You don't like the answers. A husband's upset with his wife. How do I make this marriage work with a stubborn woman like that? Well, you love her like Christ loved the church. and It's a sacrificial love. Lay your life down. Love her. Serve you. Are you out of your mind? I'm not doing that. You, you ask how it would work. I'm telling you. If you love her, it will work. You talk to the wife. How am I going to deal with this pig-headed guy? We go to church, but it doesn't seem to change it. Well, you know, if you would speak respectfully to him and be yielded to his uh, leadership in the home, if you would be submissive. So what? Are you out of your mind? I said, I'm just telling you how it works. People sometimes just want to blow you away because you're giving God's answers. But here's a woman that was willing to travel 12 to 1,400 miles, and when she got there and she asked those questions and she got the answer, it appears that she wholeheartedly believed the answers. And that's the difference. That's the difference. 
Parents will come to me and they've got a nine-year-old out of control. I had a dad one time tell me, the prisoners are running the prison. That's a scary picture. It's like a prison riot at home every, every, every day of their life. I said, well, do you love them? Do you tell them the truth? And do you discipline them? Do you spank them? Oh, no, we love them too much to discipline them. <laughs> well, I don't want to come to your house for dinner <laughs> because it's going to be a scary thing. If you don't have love, truth, and discipline, your kids are going to be a big mess. And one day, somebody is ultimately going to del- discipline them. They're, it's a guy with a badge, and he has really cool lights. They flash, and they ultimately arrest him and throw him in jail. And they're finally behind bars, and they finally will obey somebody for the first time in their whole life. You see, the hard questions in life, it's not about... It's not about your opinions, it's about what God reveals. And this woman comes. And now, not only does she get everything explained to her, but notice it takes her breath away in verse 3 and 4. And when the queen of Sheba had seen the wisdom of Solomon, the house that he had built, the food on his table, and the seating of his servants, the service of his waiters, and their apparel, his cupbearers, and their apparel, and his entryway by which he went up to the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her. It just like took her breath away. She looked around at the house of the Lord and the wisdom that Solomon had. Do you know that wisdom can be visibly seen? Do you understand that that's what this, this is saying? That when you see a marriage, you can actually see the wisdom in their marriage. You can see the wisdom in their family. You can see the wisdom in a company. You can see the wisdom uh, in, in ministry and in a church leadership. It's visible. It's tangible. You can see when you come in, you go, wow, this, this atmosphere, there's something about it. How, how would I describe it? It's like there's this, this supernatural wisdom that's going on to make things work. It's God's grace. And and it takes her breath away. And she looks around at all of this. I don't know if uh, she's going to say in the next verse that basically not the half of it was told to me. Have you ever had somebody tell you that a restaurant's amazing to show up there and it's not nearly as good as reported? Have you ever went to a monument? I remember because I had read stories about the Alamo. And I, when you go to the Alamo, and, and it's the number one national park in, because it's right in downtown, basically, San Antonio. Uh, more people visit it than any other national park. And you go to the Alamo, and here's some adobe walls, and you go, okay, this, that's no big whoo <laughs> It's kind of like, ah, I don't know, I'm not just not impressed. Have you ever just, somebody said, you've got to meet so-and-so, and you meet him, and uh, I heard a guy some time ago, he said, there's this famous guy, I wanted to meet him, I couldn't wait to meet him, and I finally had the opportunity, and I met him, and the guy could have cared less whether he's meeting me or not, and on top of that, he had bad breath. He said it was the most awful meeting ever. But every now and then, something is understated, and that's the way it was with Solomon. Not very often, but it was understated. You know, maybe if you... You've heard about the Grand Canyon, and you go, and hey, it was twice as impressive as you thought. Or you go to Niagara Falls. Years ago, my son and daughter, I don't know how they heard about it. Caleb was 18, and Jessica was 16, and they heard about these rides on top of the stratosphere in Las Vegas. I don't know if you've ever been there. And 1,000 feet up in the air, there's these, there's these three rides up on the stratosphere. And so you go to the top, the rooftop, and you're riding these rides, and, and the one ride, like, tips you over, and you're just, you know, looking over 1,000 feet. But they have this like a rocket ride where it just takes off. And I'm, I'm kind of like, I'm into rides. I'm like, bring it on, whatever. It's a ride. Woo. I mean, that was kind of my perspective. And then we got on this thing. It's got G-forces. I mean, you launch like this. We went at 10 o'clock at night. It was totally dark. And when this thing took off, it felt literally, I, I just had this sensation I'm being ejected into outer space. And then they have the picture, you know, the snapshot of what your face looks like. My face was like, My, my son and my daughter, my daughter, my wife just said, hey, I'll cheer you on from over here. But my son and daughter, all of us are, and I just had this, all three of us were like, ah. And uh, I thought it was kind of underrated until I did it. And I go, man, that's serious. Well, I, I thought my picture was, I'm like, I'm such a girl. I'm such a wimp that I cannot have this picture be the picture. You know what I mean? So I told my kids, I said, I'm going on this ride till I can just go up like this. Like really placid and calm. So it took four times. By the second time, my son's like, I've had enough of this. And my daughter, she went all four times with me. And then the last one, I was so calm. I was just all together. You know, a little smirk on my face. But sometimes, you know, things are over the top. And, and, and she travels all that way. And she gets there. And no doubt, she's built it up in her mind so, so much. To me, it's hard to imagine. But 
she didn't build it up in her mind enough. How amazing it was. She really just couldn't comprehend it. Look what she says here in verse 5 through 8. Then she said to the king, It was a true report which I heard in my own land about your words and your wisdom. However, I did not believe their words until I came and saw with my own eyes. And indeed, notice this, the half of the greatness of your wisdom was not told me. You exceed the fame of which I heard. Happy are your men and happy are these your servants who can stand continually before you and hear your wisdom. Blessed be the Lord your God who delighted in you, setting you on his throne to be king for the Lord your God. Because your God has loved Israel to establish them forever, therefore he made you king over them to do justice and righteousness. When she looked around, she, just, she had no more breath in her, just took her breath away. And she said, not even the half of it was told to me. She said, honestly, I didn't believe the report. I'm like, there's no way that he could be that smart, that he could be that wise, and that the temple could be so amazing, and Jerusalem would be so amazing. But you see, as Jesus said back in our passage there in Matthew chapter 12, verse 42, Jesus said, I am the greater than Solomon. And in their day and age, Jesus was right there. People barely had to cross the street, let alone go 12 to 1,400 miles to hear him. And yet they were not receiving him. They were rejecting him. And he said, on that day, on the judgment day in the future, the queen of Sheba, the queen of the south, is going to stand up and be able to conde- condemn that, that generation because they didn't simply believe in the greater than Solomon. I, look, I see in this an incredible picture when you see that she looked at uh, the servants of the Lord, she, or, of Solomon, and she said, imagine what it's like. Happy are the men, your servants that are around you all the time. If Solomon has this God-given wisdom and his servants that get a listen to him all day long. Imagine working for Solomon. All day long, you hear this incredible, most wise man ever to live before the Lord Jesus showed up on the scene and how happy they were to be a part of Solomon's experience. You see, the greater than Solomon, the Lord Jesus, has come. And his ministry and his life, that is what has brought you and I here together today. And you might have come because a friend invited you, but ultimately I want you to know the center of everything that we do here is about Jesus. He is the greater than Solomon. He's the one that has wisdom that brings abundant life. He's the one that brings the answers for my soul. He's the one that brings an everlasting life, which is both a quality of life here and now of love, joy, and peace, and a quantity of life forever and ever, and rescues us from a destination that the Bible calls hell. And Jesus, we, we come, and, and as people come in, and they hear the music, and they see God's servants sitting around and just enjoying the love and the joy and the peace, and they watch people serving, they watch the children singing in the, the, the children's ministry. As one dad was telling me that his little girl, she was five years old, and she said, Dad, I just love coming here, because she said, all we talk about is Jesus. And she's just five years old. She just loves it. She just loves to be a part of it. One summer night years ago when we had Sunday night services, I watched this dad. Literally, he was dragging his son. His son was about four or five, and he had cowboy boots on, and he didn't want to go to church. And he's like, no, I don't want to go. And I'm standing out in front of the church, and I'm watching this. And the dad said, we're going to church. And he had his head down. And he was was skiing with his little boots. There's just skiing right across. He wasn't taking steps. And he came to the church, and I thought, oh, that's going to be a hard night for this little boy. He doesn't want to be here. It's going to be so hard. And then after service, because it was one of those summer nights, I'm standing out in front again, and now the dad's dragging him out because, no, I don't want to leave. It's so great. I don't want to leave. And literally, he's skiing across the parking lot to his truck. Why is that? People come into the house of the Lord, and from the opening song or the opening prayer, they don't even know why. They just begin to cry. They begin to weep. They... They'll ask us afterwards, why, why am I, I feel like I'm, I'm falling apart. Why am I crying? We, we try to explain to them, that's the spirit of the Lord. That's the love of Jesus touching your heart. That's, that's the love of God that is ministering to you. And, and I know it might be foreign to you. Maybe you've never been around something like this. Maybe you've never experienced something like this. Now, we who get to enjoy it all the time, we who are his servants and our staff all the time, they say, man, we wish the whole church could see what we see all week long of people getting saved, of people being ministered to, about people turning to the Lord, about people, their lives being reconciled, and just God bringing broken-hearted people that have hard questions and difficult questions, and what do we do with our life? Last night after service is one of the young couples 
like 20 years old or so. And as they were just sharing their life with me, and they're, they're here at church, and they're like, man, we, we want to come here because we've, it's really the only place we've found hope. He, him coming from a, a meth background and, and just kind of the whole, the whole brokenness of their life. And it was such a thrill for me to see this young couple, and they're just looking for the answers that are in Jesus. They come into the house of the Lord. And you see, I heard about Jesus from the time I was a little kid. My grandparents took me to church. They told me about Jesus. But honestly, even though I heard about Jesus and I saw these older people, I really thought Jesus was for old people. Jesus is for old people that are about ready to die and they need to go to heaven. So just old people should get right with Jesus. But us young people, we're going to do what we want to do. It was kind of my perspective. But honestly, not the half of the of the quality of life. I didn't get it. And 32 years ago, in this month of February, I had a personal, radical experience, home alone, in my bedroom, on my knees with Jesus. And he saved my soul. And not the half of anything that I saw in church as a little kid when I went there, or what I saw in my my grandparents' life, or anything. I, I had no idea of this abundant life that was available for me for the first time to have love and joy and peace. You see, it doesn't matter how much money you make. It doesn't matter where you work. It doesn't matter how many material things you have, how many relationships you have. Without Jesus, your life is always, always going to be half of what it could be. Your marriage is going to be half of what it could be. Your kids are going to be half of what they could be. Because he promised to bring abundant life. And he promised to bring the answers to the questions of your heart. And he is the one that can fulfill it. He can do it. Jesus can do it. And so in this story, as we see this unfold, she just unloads her heart. She just says, man, I can't believe this. Now, there's a question mark among commentators if her declaration is one of true faith on her part. But I think we can say at least she's overwhelmed by the whole experience. She's overwhelmed by this experience that the Lord would touch her life in such a radical way. But notice in verse 9 and then verse 12, it says, And she gave the king 120 talents of gold, spices in great abundance, and precious stones. There never were any spices such as those the queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. But in verse 12, it says, Now King Solomon gave to the queen of Sheba all she desired, whatever she asked, much more than she had brought to the king. The queen of Sheba brought a gift and gave it to Solomon, but Solomon gave her way more. It doesn't describe it, but she received much more than she gave. And that's the way it is when you come to the greater than Solomon, the Lord Jesus. When I came to the Lord Jesus, I had, I mean, over the years, I've often told the Lord in prayer that he really got the short end of the stick when he got me. Because it's like, he's this awesome, loving, wonderful, eternal Savior, and then it's Rick. (laughs) It's, It's like, there's a... All you can do is offer your heart, offer your life. Hey, Lord, I love you. I want to serve you. I want to follow you. But it seems like probably about this much. You ever see a little kid that wants to help his dad with something? You know what I mean? Dad's out there mowing the lawnmower, and the four-year-old's got one of those little toy lawnmowers, and and he's out there helping him. And and really, the child is in the way more than anything else. And and, and Dad just lets him kind of go along. And and that's the way I feel when I get to help the Lord. It's like I got my little toy lawnmower. He's doing all the work, but, and he, you know, I'm kind of in the way most of the time, but he, he, he allows me to be a part of things. And so we receive so much more than we could ever give to the Lord Jesus. But this is the greatest thing that I can give to him is my love, my love for him. That's what he wants. The greatest gift I can give to Jesus, the Bible says, those who are forgiven much, love much. And that's what he's looking for. He's not looking for, you know, a list of works. He's, he just wants to have a loving relationship with you. Now, the queen of Sheba, after she receives this, it says at the end of verse 12, so she turned and went to her own country, she and her servants. Now, don't doubt that whole crew, when they thought, we got to go home, 
there's probably part of them that just didn't want to do it. You know what I mean? They're in the greatest place on planet Earth they've ever experienced with the wisdom of God and the love of God and the people of God and everything that's happening there. They've discovered the temple, how do you offer sacrifices and get right with God. And ultimately, this was God's desire. If you look at Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 1 and verse 10, the Lord had wanted Israel to be this incredible place so that all the nations of the world could be introduced to the God of Israel. And now they got to go home. So you know all the way home, what are they talking about? They're talking about Solomon and his wisdom. And then they get home, and they've got to tell everybody about Solomon and his wisdom. Because that's what happens to us. All through the New Testament, when Jesus touched somebody's life, and they ultimately left that encounter, they wanted to tell everybody. The woman at the well. Isn't it interesting that Solomon's wisdom really has bookends, if you will, about personal encounters? The first is two prostitutes that are fighting over a baby. I would say that's probably the lowest, most low economic and moral standard there could be. Two prostitutes shacked up, I mean, just living together, having babies. And now a queen that was willing to travel 12 to 1,400 miles. But you see, his wisdom was good for the prostitute, and it was good for royalty. It's good for everybody in between. It's good for you. It's good for me, whether you're young, old, rich, poor, bad, good, whatever you are. But ultimately... When we come to know the Lord, we want others to know. The woman at the well, when Jesus met her there, the Samaritan woman, and they had this conversation. And ultimately, Jesus was probing at her heart. He was trying to get to her hard questions, and she was kind of hard and had everything surfacy. And he finally penetrated her heart, and he said, why don't you go get your husband? She said, my husband? Well, I don't have a husband. He said, well, you're right. You don't have a husband. You've had five husbands, and the guy you're living with currently, he's not your husband. So you've got six guys in your history. You've never had any fulfillment in your life. You've went from man to man to man to man to man. Never been satisfied. None of your questions of your heart have ever been answered. And you're just this lonely, broken woman that keeps groping in the dark for relationships to fulfill you. And at that point, she said, well, I know when Messiah comes, when the Savior comes. And he said, I am the Savior. She puts down her water pot. She runs into town, and she tells all the Samaritan men, she said, you've got to come meet the Messiah you got to come meet the Savior. And so they all come out of town, and they beg him to stay three days, and then they speak. Jesus shares with them the hope that he is the Savior. And finally, the men say to the woman, they said, we, do not, we no longer believe because you told us. We believe because we've heard it with our own ears. You see, your first reaction when you fall in love with Jesus is to go home and tell everybody you know and care about, about the goodness and of the love of Jesus. When the man at Gadara who was demon-possessed with a thousand demons. He's clothed and in his right mind, and he begs Jesus on the shore of Galilee. He goes, Lord, can I go with you? And Jesus said, no, I want you to go home, and I want you to tell all your friends and family the great things that God has done for you. And so that's exactly what he did. When the shepherds were told that there was this sign, a baby was lying in a manger in Bethlehem, the city of David, Christ the Lord is born. They went there, they saw the miracle, they worshiped, and then it says, then they spread the word. They made it widely known that the Savior's been born. Do you know another group of people traveled from a long ways away? They were the wise men in Matthew chapter 2, and they saw this star, and they traveled all the way here with gold, frankincense, and myrrh so that they might worship the King of the Jews. There's this heart to, to travel, to seek. Every human is seeking. You might not travel miles, but you're seeking. This is the ultimate picture of those who are seeking the goodness of God for their life. See, the Bible says to seek the Lord. Check out a couple of these verses as we wrap it up this morning. It says in Isaiah 55, 6 and 7, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Turn from your life of sin and he will have mercy on you. It says in Psalm 27, 8, I love this. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, you're face, Lord, I will seek. The Lord says, why don't you seek me? And the psalmist says, okay, I will. <laughs> and he seeks the Lord. He responds to that. And then it says in Matthew 7, 8, for everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, it will be open to him. Are you seeking? Are you asking? Are you knocking? Do you want the abundant life that Jesus offers to you, the greater than Solomon? Do you want his love, his joy, his peace? 
Are you willing, when he gives you the answers of the hard questions of your heart that you're looking for, are you willing to embrace those answers and yield to them and be obedient? Some of you are not walking in the abundant life that God has for you because you know the answers to the questions of your heart, but your heart is hard and you won't receive those answers. And so it's like a doorway that you could go through, and through that doorway there's love and joy and peace. There's abundant life through that doorway, but because you set your face, you fold your arms, you set your jaw, you go, I don't like that. I don't like that answer. So it's, well, there's abundant life through that door. But you've got to yield to it. You see, the door handle of your heart is not on the outside, it's on the inside. And you need to open your heart. You need to seek the Lord while he may be found. And whether you've been walking with the Lord for years, but you're troubled about some things, will you receive the wise answers that Jesus gives to you and to me? And if you do, and you begin to, you know, this is a beautiful thing for my life, as I've just discovered that I have all these thoughts and all these opinions and all these inclinations that are totally out of line with God inside of me. You got any of those? I want all the wrong things. If God wants me to have white, I want black. If God, you know what I mean? He wants up, I want down. It's, it's inverted. It's, it's like all of sin, my, my twisted sin nature, wants the exact opposite of, of what God wants. And so in order to become a fruitful Christian, I've had to discover, oh, I'm an idiot, <laughs> and he's really smart. <laughs> it's just really that simple. And so if his word says this, then I say, Lord, I want to walk in, believe in, and yield to you, and... I'm just going to turn from my own opinions. That's why many people at church, after a service, they'll say, Pastor Rick, what's, what do you think about you know, ABC? And I'll say, well, the Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says. No, I said, no, I ask what your opinion is. My opinion's worth nothing. God's opinion is worth something. His opinion's worth something. My, my opinion's, so what? I mean, it, it's worth spit. But his opinion, if you make Jesus the center of your world, if you make Jesus the center of your life, if you make Jesus the center of your marriage and your family and your work and your service to him, the quality of your life will ramp up to a place that a few years from now you will say to yourself, I could not imagine the quality of life, of his love and his joy and his peace that I'm enjoying because he's the center. And, I, and I'm, tired, I'm, I'm no longer going to fight with him. I'm no longer going to argue with him. I'm just, yes, sir, no, sir. Yes, sir, no, sir. Whatever you want, Lord, I submit. And I pray that for some of us, that's a place that you've been at the doorway, but you haven't yielded. You still think your opinions are more important than God's. You still think your opinions are more important than God's, even though you know they're in direct contradiction to God's. And until that gives up and you can say, he's Lord and you're the servant, because as long as your opinion holds the same weight in your heart as his, he's not Lord. You're Lord. You're Lord. There are two kinds of people in this world. Two kinds of people. There are those who say, not my will be done, but your will be done. And the other kind of people is, not your will be done, my will be done. Those are the two kind of people. Which one are you? The one is a very wise person. The other one is the biggest fool walking on planet Earth. Father, we just ask that you'd meet us in this place with your incredible wisdom, Lord Jesus. You are the greater than Solomon. We pray that your spirit would do just a, a work of refreshment in each one of our souls. We just confess that we need you. And I know that there's a lot of issues of the heart that even this morning, Lord, there's, there's questions that I know some people just, they just want to surrender to your answer today. They haven't wanted to, but they want to surrender to that answer today. So we're just in an attitude of prayer before we close in song. If you're here today and you've just been fighting with the Lord in your opinion and his opinion, but you know what he says, but today you want to surrender, I just want to invite you to stand up right where you're at, and I'm going to pray for you and pray for me that God would help our hearts be soft. So just stand up right where you're at. You're tired of fighting against God's opinion. You're tired of arguing with his opinion. You're tired of wanting, demanding your way over his way. And the Lord just wants to knock on the door of your heart and just say, man, let today be that day. Let this be the day. Let this be the day. God bless you guys. Anybody else before we pray? The Lord's just knocking on your heart. It's time to surrender. 
It's time to call him Lord and yield to him. Let's pray. Father, I just pray for the men and women all over this room that are standing right now. And just by standing, Lord, they are making an incredible, bold declaration about their own hearts that today they choose to surrender to your opinion. They're tired of fighting with their own opinion. They're tired of fighting in their own head. They're tired of kicking against the goads that you declared to Saul of Tarsus. They're just tired of it. And they have been unwilling to surrender. They have been unwilling to yield. They have been unwilling. But Lord, today is the day that they bring the hard questions and the incredible answers that you want to bring to their souls. I just pray that you'd overwhelm them with a sense of your love, overwhelm them with a sense of your peace, overwhelm them with a sense of your joy, Lord, as they release this and they trust you with it and they just give it to you and ask that you would work. Lord, we pray that you would just give us soft hearts to live in a daily place that is yielded to you and your truth. And so, Lord, we give you praise and glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen.